Well, hello, this is Adam. Welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today we're going to talk about the strange features, quirks, and idiosyncrasies of my 1986 Oldsmobile 98 Regency. Yes, that is a mouthful, and that is the name of this car. It's the standard 98, not the 98 Regency Brome, which have been a little bit more expensive than this. But this is off of General Motors' C-Body platform that came out and debuted in 1985. The first full-size front-wheel drive cars from General Motors with the transversely mounted engine and transmission. Yes, GM did have front-wheel drive cars before this. The 1966 Olds Tornado, the 67 Eldorado were some of the first of those. But this was the first time that Oldsmobile in a full-size car, well, full-size for the time, had that transversely mounted engine and transmission under hood. So as I said, this was a platform that came out in 1985. This is an 86 model. And the Olds 98 usually had a number of distinguishing features versus the 88. The first was this egg crate grille was a 98 feature. The Delta 88 often had vertical bars. And the egg crate grille was a feature that you often found on Cadillacs as well that connoted luxury. The 98 also had another Cadillac style element, these vertical tail lamps out back. It's funny how many people, when they see this car, say, a nice Cadillac. Well, it's not a Cadillac. It's an Oldsmobile, which was an issue that General Motors faced with these vehicles, and Lincoln famously parodied in an ad for their town car, where a customer comes up to a valet and asks for his car, which is supposed to be, I think, in a Cadillac, and they bring a Buick, and then brings an Oldsmobile, and GM was getting lambasted during this time period for look-alike cars and really they really weren't doing too much differently than what they had done in previous years. This car shares its roof, front glass, rear glass, and the door glass as well as I believe the front doors with the Buick 90, sorry the Buick Electra and the doors are different and the glass is different on the Cadillac DeVille but the Olds and the Buick shared quite a bit and that was true all the way back to 1959 model year in particular where General Motors vehicles say, share the same roof, side glass, back glass and a lot of models and the front doors were patterned off of the Buick across the entire lineup Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick and Cadillac all used the Buick front door this vertical tail lamp theme started in the early 60s for Oldsmobile, I believe 1963. And that was during a time when a number of the GM divisions were trying to pattern their rear styling off a of Cadillac on the upper end trims. The Buick Electra did something similar. And Pontiac also did something similar too on their vehicles in the early 60s and had vertical tail lights. Interestingly, Mercury would copy some of that Pontiac styling and use it on their vehicles and endow them with vertical taillights until the 1969 model year when it changed. So this car is about 30 inches shorter than the Olds 98s that were rear wheel drive and came out in 1971 and lasted through 1976, the biggest of the Olds 98s. This car is a little under 200 inches in length. And those vehicles were 226-ish or so inches long. So it's a lot shorter, but it's got a lot of room on the inside. This car does have the cornering lights, which was an option. You can see down there. And it does have the wire wheel discs that have the Ransom E. Olds crest on them, which is the same as the hood ornament on the 98 Regency. And you also got opera lights, LED opera lights here that illuminated at night with again the Ransom E. Olds crest. And get it on the trunk as well. Turning to the inside, the first thing you'll notice is an Oldsmobile unique chime that was only on Oldsmobiles you got the Buick or the Cadillac, the Cadillac actually had the real bell and the Buick had a different chime to it. This car has quite a few options. In the Olds 98 there were a lot of things that were standard but still there was a lot that was optional. It has power seats on both sides. 
They did come standard with power windows. It has power locks, has the somewhat automatic climate control. You can control the temperature, or you have uh, automatic temperature control, but then you select the mode and then the fan speed here. You've got four fan speeds that you can choose from. These cars have a lot of idiot lights, as you can see, the service engine soon light. And they did have a gauge package for these, but that was pretty rare. People who were buying Oldsmobiles didn't want the gauge package or didn't really care all that much. And if you got the 98, you got the chrome gas and brake pedals. This, incidentally, is the ALDL terminal connector that if you want to understand what the codes are, if you have the service engine soon light on when you're driving the car, you ground out two of these terminals. I can't remember which corner, but two adjacent terminals in one of the corners. And then that service engine soon light will blink whatever the code is. So if it's a code 32 as an example, the light will go blink, 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 then pause for a second, blink, blink, and it'll repeat that three times. So it can give you an idea of what trouble you may be facing. This car does have the Twilight Sentinel as well that automatically turns on the headlights and you can change the delay for how long you want the headlights to stay on after you turn the car off. If you want to impress your friends with strange bits of trivia, you can tell that the window switches in these, which typically failed if they've been replaced, because you can hear an audible click when you use them. Hear that? So this switch has been replaced. This switch, however, has not. And when I push it, it's a less metallic-y clicking noise. So this one has never been replaced. They tended to fail relatively frequently. GM did spend a lot of money on the interior in this car. And you can see that this door panel is a very expensive door panel with the cloth upper, a soft padded armrest, and the carpeted lower. This is really before the interiors on these GM vehicles got very plasticky, and this interior feels very rich, despite the faux wood grain, which was unique to the 98. If you got the 88, you had like this brushed aluminum looking trim piece, what I actually think looks better. But here you have this faux wood grain on the steering wheel and across the instrument panel, and this padded top pad on the instrument panel. You also have assist handles, front and rear, in all places aside from where it is here. There's not one where the driver would grab on. And you've got some pretty complicated sun visors with vanity mirrors, very bright vanity mirrors. That's the low setting. If you want to blind yourself at night, turn on the high setting. And they do have a slide out here so you can move the, the mirror over here. And then if you want a little bit more shade, you can pull this out as an extender do have reading lights in case you need those at night and also a vanity mirror well not on this car that would have been an option on the driver's side driver doesn't need to look and see if he or she looks good anyway this car does have the kind of universal GM Delco electronic tuned radio with the cassette tape player these radios actually sound very very good even by modern standards. I think they sound better than modern radios. GM did a nice job with these Delco radios, except sometimes they have trouble tuning in stations or they go on the fritz a little bit, but overall pretty good. This car's got a lot of interior room. Notice how low, if I close the door here, the belt line is. You have beautiful sight lines out of the entire vehicle, something that you just don't have anymore. The seats are extremely comfortable. The 98 Regency came with these button tufted seats. The Regency Brome would have a different interior. And you get that look in the front and the rear with these loose cushion seats. That was really patterned off of the seats that came out in the 1972 98 Regency when the Regency was the top of the line trim. And then somehow over the years, the Regency name migrated to be the base Olds 98 and the Regency Brome became the top of the line car. This car also does have the optional litter container down there that you kind of slide out if you want to remove it. But yeah, you get your own little trash can in the car. 
Let's pop the hood and take a look there. This does have GM's famous 3.8 liter V6, the pre-3800, which came out in 1988, meaning it doesn't have a balance shaft. It's 140 horsepower. In 1986, there were two versions of GM's 3.8 engine, one that made 140 horsepower and one with roller rockers that made 150 horsepower. This is the 140 horsepower variant. And you'll notice that the cylinder banks, there's no forward cylinder bank in this engine. These cylinder banks are in line with one another. And because GM was trying to get this 90 degree V6 to be relatively smooth, that means that the connecting rods are not in the center of the piston. And consequently, the pistons have to be pretty big because they have to have skirts so that they don't cock on their bores when they go up and down. Whereas the 3800 that came out in 1988 didn't have to have that. And that engine is really what made the 3.8 famous. These engines are pretty durable. They really don't have too many problems. Sometimes the fuel injectors can get a little drippy over time. The you know, typical things like the starter or alternator. The water pumps usually tend to last to about 110, 120,000 miles. And around that time, these have that wonderful phenolic cam gear as well as them that tends to shed a tooth and then the engine stops running because the camshaft isn't spinning anymore. So like I said, that tends to happen around eh, 110 to 130,000 miles on these. Not ideal. I picked this car up in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I did it because look at how clean this car is under hood. I don't think this ever saw any sort of inclement weather. And even inside the engine, I don't know if you can see there, but it's absolutely pristine, very well-maintained, well-loved vehicle. If you're buying one of these, also check to make sure the steering works. The steering racks in these from the factory weren't that great, and they tended to get morning sickness, meaning you'd try to turn the wheel early in the morning and it would almost be like you didn't have power steering. This car's actually got a rebuilt steering rack in it, which by the way, that's not an easy job. So if one has hard steering, you might want to stay away from it. I do love that they had to put a beauty cover over the EGR valve that serves no other purpose than to just make it look good. Why they felt the need to do that, I don't quite know. But GM was into engine dress-up during this time period and making things look a little bit better. That had started with the 1984 Corvette area under hood. Here you've got your standard throttle and then you've got your mass airflow sensor. This was the first application of the hot air film mass airflow sensor in General Motors cars. I should say the 1985 model was. These cars did have some stalling problems and they redesigned the mass airflow sensor in 1987 to have more of a, a venturi shape here and then a honeycomb filter up front so that it straightened the airflow as it went over that hot film. And because this engine doesn't have a balance shaft, you can't see it, but trust me down there, there's a little shock absorber that's bolted to the uh, engine to really quell the vibrations. And this car is pretty smooth at idle and at cruising speed at about a thousand rpms it's got a little bit of a shake nothing too offensive but still the 3800 with the balance shaft was definitively better if you want to replace your windshield washer pump they all crap out on these that's where it is here and you can tell i actually didn't replace this one somebody did before me there's a little tab here that always breaks off when you're trying to replace it it's usually just fine. It never falls out. This car does have the 440T4 transmission, which was General Motors' first transmission in these full-size front-wheel drive cars, and it was not very robust. It tended to fail relatively early, particularly 1985 model year. You can see the transmission here. If, by the way, your lockup solenoid isn't disengaging, Temporarily, at least on these, you can just unhook that connector and disengage it. On these transmissions, you don't tend to want to drive them, though, in overdrive with that unhooked. You can drive it in the D setting, but not the overdrive setting. The Turbo Hydromatic 125 transmissions, you can unhook the connector and not worry about it, drive it around all day long. 
That's the modulator valve as well that controls the transmission shift firmness. And then this is the throttle valve cable here that controls the shift points on the transmission, which you can adjust by depressing this button here and moving this little slider rod in and out to delay or force upshift sooner, depending on what your preference is. So all these aren't necessarily great collectibles. They are great cars to own, and they drive very, very nicely. With lots of room and good fuel economy, the 3800 engine cars, you'll get high 20s on the freeway. Miles per gallon, even 30 miles per gallon. This car gets about eh, 26 on the freeway. And you can see the trunk here, how, just how big it is. Pretty enormous trunk with good lining and I've got some of the original paperwork and brochure and the door edge guards that I took off here. Ooh, and Oldsmobile's complimentary cassette, the tape, where you can listen to the jingle. There is a special feel in an Oldsmobile. But very, very roomy trunk. Again, roomy car overall. And there you have it, the Olds. 98 Regency for 1986. Hope you enjoyed this little video on this particular vehicle. Thanks for watching.